A message to Gary Lineker, who says he's going to take in a refugee to live with him in his home. Come on, Gary. Haven't they suffered enough? It's the Pod 20, the definitive countdown of the top 20 podcasts. At 19, an Englishman in from Rob Goldstone. Rob, you were involved with Russiagate because you sent an infamous email. What exactly happened? It's my uh, it's my least favourite subject. <laughs> um, but the only so, one that anyone ever wants to talk the only about. The anyone I cares about. Yeah. Um, so basically, I, you know, I had got to know Donald Trump and his son a little bit because I was managing a Russian pop star named Emin. And in doing so, we ended up doing uh, the Miss Universe contest at Emin's venue that he owned in Russia. And so we got kind of friendly, I suppose you would say, with the Trumps. And a year or two later, he now famously called me and asked if I would mind calling the Trumps to set up a meeting with the Trump, somebody within the Trumps, who was running for president, we may add, at that time, and a well-connected Russian attorney whom his father had met that day and who had some kind of damaging information on the Democrats. And I was shocked because, first of all, Emin had never taught politics with me ever. We taught music, he played video games, he was a bit crazy but we never taught politics. So I tried to, as any journalist would, push him for a little bit more information. And I asked him what it was about, what it meant. And he said, why do you care? It doesn't matter. You don't have to go to the meeting. You don't have to report on the meeting. Can you just get the meeting? And I pushed back a couple of times. uh, And at which point, I don't know if you've had this, but there comes a time when you know your client that There's no point in pushing anymore. You can either say yes, you can say maybe, or you can say no and perhaps look for a new job. What I did say to him was that no good could come of this. And that was based on the idea in my mind that we were wasting a favor with a man who could become the president of the United States for some random attorney, according to him, that was some friend of his father. And that's why I said that. A lot of people thought I said it because of the gravitas of what was contained within the ask. It wasn't. It's because selfishly, I thought, if Donald Trump becomes president and we're a bit friendly with him, I know where your next video will be filmed and it's a big white house. Now, the... The content of the email seems to be the problem. Right. It, it, I, I've got it in front of me. It says, Emin... Now, so this is the email you sent to Donald Trump Jr. And Donald Trump Jr.'s official title during the campaign? What was that? Was he... He, was, he wasn't the camp, He wasn't running, looking after the campaign, was he? That was the other fella. He was kind of like the unloved son. <laughs> He didn't have a title. He right, was okay. Donald Trump's son. But obviously, was, he was, but obviously it's his dad. Yeah, yeah. And you, you said, Emin just called and asked me to contact you with something very interesting. The Crown Prosecutor of Russia, and we'll get back to that phrase, the Crown Prosecutor of Russia met with his father, Aras, who is a, a Moscow-based developer, tried to partner with Trump years before that. Anyway, he says this morning in a meeting offered to provide the Trump campaign with some official documents and information that would incriminate Hillary and her dealings with Russia and would be very useful to your father. That right. that was a, a puffed up version of, of what you had, wasn't it? It was a puffed up version of the truth and it was a puffed up version of a half truth because Emin wouldn't give me all the information. So what he told me when I said, well, who is this attorney? He said, a prosecutor who's well connected. So when I hear well connected, I was a journalist. I'm a publicist. Well, she's not connected to the local scouts or the local (laughs) Aldi. She's, in my mind, connected to the Kremlin. She's a prosecutor. The word Crown Prosecutor is very interesting. So because I'm told that she's a prosecutor, to me, with my British hat on, I call prosecutors Crown Prosecutors because it's the Crown Prosecution. As anyone who knows history will know, there hasn't been a Crown in Russia since 1917. So there isn't a Crown Prosecutor. What I should have said is he met with 
a crown prosecutor, not the. Because even though there wasn't a the, what the media took that to mean was a man who is, in fact, the prosecutor general of Russia, who they assumed I was talking about. Well, I've never heard of that man. I just meant that she, in effect, was what in the States we call a federal prosecutor and what in England you would call a crown prosecutor, meaning they prosecute people, they don't defend people. Now, provide documents and information. Well, if you have information, as Emin told me, which was potentially damaging to the Democrats, you must have a bit of paper, you must have some documents, but he never told me there were documents. I just was like, there's documents, there's paper. If there isn't, who cares? But you decided and, you decided to interpret that, or at least in the email, correct. incriminating, that could incriminate yeah. Hillary. So it was that much was the heavier worst than... part about that. No, no, that was the worst <laughs> part. So the idea was that this information, whatever it was that this lawyer had, was in some way damaging to the Democrats. Now, again... I did work for The Sun for a while. If it's damaging to the Democrats, the only Democrat that anyone cares about in the Trump world is the one who's running against him, who's Hillary Clinton. But I have on many occasions apologized for only one thing, which is it had nothing to do with Hillary Clinton. And my email sound, makes it sound like it incriminates something she has done. What it really does was incriminate these people that the lawyer for donating to her campaign. So the words were really twisted the wrong way around. But I've said that from the beginning, that wasn't my intention. If I had one regret, it would be to take Hillary's name out. Because if Bernie was running, it would have said Bernie Sanders. If Boris Johnson was running, it would have said Boris. It was about the party. I interpret it as Hillary, because again, I'm a publicist. So the trigger for me is, you need key words to get people's attention. Hillary will get the attention. Democratic National Convention, maybe they won't read. The intention with this email was to get Donald Trump Jr.'s attention enough to read the email, but see what I put at the end, which was, but maybe you should speak with Emin directly about it first. Now, that, that bit hasn't been as publicised as the rest of the email, has it? Especially because what has been publicised is Don Jr.'s response, <laughs> which was, if it's what you say it is, I love it. But he also said, I agree. I should speak to Emin about it. Can you set that up? I then set up that call in a series of emails which have all been made public, but which the media ignored, those two spoke and I never thought about it again. Because if you think about it, why would I care? Even if, for two reasons, if I'm right about everything I've supposed in this email, they will have spoken about it. If I'm wrong, equally they will have spoken about it. So once they agreed to speak, and more importantly, once they did speak, I didn't care how puffed up this was because two human beings have spoken to each other. So I assume they speak about the words that they're both copied on in the email. And the idea was to get a meeting. So really, you did your job. You got them to want a meeting and you set the meeting up. So you were really right. only a fixer, a middleman, really. I mean, you've been accused of being a Russian spy. Yeah, I was Putin's <laughs> puppet. But interestingly enough, which is lovely, which interestingly enough, I was also accused of being Hillary's puppet. A lot of people think I set this up on behalf of the Democrats to discredit Trump ultimately when this would come out. What's interesting is, as I've testified on numerous occasions, both on Capitol Hill and to Mueller, I wasn't pro-Trump. I wasn't pro-Hillary. I was pro my client. So all I was trying to do was do my job to a billionaire client who, by the very nature of that word, makes them hugely demanding. They're not used to having people say, oh, I couldn't do that, or no. And by the nature of the job I did, I was his manager. I wasn't just his publicist. We were 24 hours a day. We talked eight hours a day about nonsense. It's just another ask. It was an annoying ask, but it didn't set off a... Bell. A lot of people go, didn't you know it was wrong? And what I say is, because just so that your, your viewers, your listeners understand, I was told by the Mueller team, you can write whatever you want in an email. We're not saying your email was wrong. Their willingness to accept 
what potentially was foreign interference is what could be wrong. So they said, this, as long as you don't threaten to kill somebody in email, do whatever, you can say whatever you want. The intent to receive it was what was being examined. So when people say to me, as many people do, how could you not know it was wrong to offer this? Well, I grew up in Manchester. I know nothing about this. The chairman of the Trump campaign was in the meeting. You would think he knows something about American legal system as it relates to politics. You would yeah. hope. Actually, yeah. you wouldn't hope because he's in jail. I think they just let him out for COVID, Paul Manafort, <laughs> but he was jailed. So maybe he didn't know either. The thing that when I first read it, I thought this all seems very, very suspicious and I'm not sure if I'm buying your story. Now, talking to you, I see exactly what's going on. And to give it some context, that first line of your email that said, Emin just called. So he's a pop star or from Azerbaijan or, or Russia. Yeah, he's from Azerbaijan. He lives in Russia. They all, Trump, Donald in particular, was already very fond of him because of the dealings you'd had with Miss Universe. Do you want to just talk us through that so that it makes more sense? Because on the face of it, it looks like, well, this pushy British promoter has tried to set up a meeting with high-ranking officials from the, the Trump campaign were in it. Uh, you know, how does a guy like that do that? That doesn't sound... It doesn't sound like that's how things work. Yet, just give us a little bit of background about the relationship that Donald Trump had with Emin and how that came about via Miss Universe. So, so you're exactly right, and it does sound bizarre. It's a good word <laughs> to most people. Um, so back in 2012, I began managing Emin, and one of the things I wanted to do, because he'd grown up in the States, he lived in London part of the time, as well as in Moscow, was to internationalize his music. And I knew we needed some global platforms. And it just so happened that I happened to know someone who had been named Miss Universe. And we needed a beautiful woman for his video. And I said, well, why don't I ask her? She's called Diana Mendoza. I said, why don't I ask her? And I asked her, I said, would you like to be in his video? She said, no. I said, thank you very much. And she said, but I'm happy to connect you with the Miss Universe organization and maybe they can help. She did. I spoke to the president of Miss Universe, who was very nice, and she said, come in, have a meeting. And I said, well, Emin's going to be here in a couple of weeks. We'll both come in. And we went in and he's extremely charming and funny and whatever. And so we had a great meeting. But it ended up not being about his video because we talked about, Emin suddenly said, where are you doing this year's contest? And they said, we haven't locked down a location. He said, what about Moscow? And I should point out Emin and his family are like the Trumps of Russia. They own a lot of retail and commercial developments, including one of the best concert halls or performance venues in Moscow. And so they said, well, we have thought about Russia before. It's full of red tape. It never happens. And at which point, Paula Sugar, who's the head of Miss Universe, said, I even went to look at this venue uh, a year or two back called Crocus City Hall. We could never get dates. It was never open. And Emin smiled and looked at me and said, well, you should just tell her. And I said, well, he owns it. So um, it was kind of like, oh. And he said, well, why don't we just do it there? And it was as simple as that. It went on from there. Now, the reason we're talking about this is because Donald Trump was a co-owner of Miss Universe. He owned it with NBC TV. And so it was suggested that we all meet again in a month in Las Vegas. And at that meeting would be Donald Trump and Emin would bring his father, Araz, who ran this billion dollar empire. And they'd have like a, hello, how are you? And sign a contract and they would announce on stage that night at Miss USA, that Moscow would be the host. And that's how I got to know Donald Trump. And that's how Emin got to know Donald Trump. And even though it's been written that I've been friends of the Trumps for years, I mean, I've literally been written about as if I am their long lost adopted son. I mean, it's unbelievable how people have described me. I've met Donald Trump either five or six times. And I met his son, Don Jr. twice. Right. And I've met right. you once. Yeah. So you're halfway there. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that really connected them was when, was in Las Vegas, wasn't it? 
Yeah, they really bonded. I mean, first of all, Donald Trump is Donald Trump. So even though uh, Emin's family were about, according to Forbes magazine, the 54th or 53rd richest family in Russia, when they appeared in the Trump Hotel in, in uh, Las Vegas, I happened to be in the lobby and Trump bellowed across the lobby, look who's come to see me, the richest family in Russia. Now, he knew as well as everyone else, they were the 53rd, but that doesn't bother Donald Trump. When you're in his presence, you're the richest family. Where they seemed to bond was he invited himself to a dinner that night that Emin was giving for his friends and family. And it was a real cast of characters, it was interesting. And I was organizing it, and I was the one that got the call from Trump's uh, security assistant, Keith, who said, um, Mr. Trump would like to come to dinner, where is it? And I, of course, told him, he goes, is that okay? I said, yeah, absolutely fine. And I hung up and I called Emin and he was like, what? And I said, you, you obviously made an impression, Donald Trump's coming to dinner. And he goes, okay, I have two requests. One, you deal with it, and B, you sit between Trump and I. And I was like, okay. So we go down for dinner, we have dinner, and there was a moment, which I think is what you're referring to, where they, to me, they bonded, where Trump stopped the conversation and said, Emin, I have a question for you. If I was to take a million dollars off the cost of putting on, of licensing this show, Miss Universe, to you and your family, would you tell me if you've slept with any of the contestants? And everyone's like, ha, 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 how funny. And Emin, cool as a cucumber, said, that's really interesting. Mr. Trump, and he always called him Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump, I'll pay you an additional $5 million if you tell me if you've ever slept with any of the contestants. And there's this silence, and Trump laughs and goes, should we just drop the deal? And it was funny, because I was like, there you go. There's a bonding made in frat boy heaven. <laughs> they were like two silly frat boys that had out, not shocked, but you know what I mean. They'd out shocked the table. And from then on, they were friendly. We went out to a nightclub afterwards. Trump again said he'd like to come. Uh, it was a, a place called The Act, which the equivalent in England would be The Box. Uh, it's a sort of sexy burlesque nightclub it's supposedly artistic in its design and you know there were acts at that club where people simulated peeing on each other a lot has been written about the fact that perhaps that's where the rumor of the pee tape comes into it um and they really got on well so well that he wouldn't leave so the entire evening i had emin in my ear going get rid of him when's he going home and all i remember saying to emin was i'm british so let me explain this is royal protocol Re think of him as the queen you don't move till he moves and we stayed and he stayed a couple of hours and the second he left we all left and that was it after that friends when emin would come to new york maybe three or four times he would say let's go and see mr trump trump was always very gracious he always found time for us it was a 10 minute visit perhaps and on one of those occasions I remember two very old, three. On one occasion, he was listening to rap music when we appeared. And I walked in, he goes, you're in music, look, I've got this platinum disc. And I looked and he goes, yeah, this, is, this song, it's called Donald Trump, and it's got 90 million views on YouTube. And I said, I would just suggest you listen to the words of that song. And we all laughed and he said to me, I don't care about the words, it's got 94 million views on YouTube. He didn't care about the words, that plaque was on his wall. Another time we went in, we'd been in this wind swept, it was raining, and he looked at me and he went, there's something weird with your hair. And I said, if we're gonna have a hair debate <laughs> and one of us loses, it isn't me. And he laughed, because that's Donald Trump. He's like, and then the final time was a few months before he announced his run for president. And he told Emin and I, he said, I'm running for president. And we were like, wow, that's amazing. And Emin was like, you know, I, 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 that really is incredible. We congratulated him on the way out. We got to the bottom in Trump Tower and we both said the same thing. You know he's going to win. And we each said, well, there's no question of it. And then Emin said to me, and neither of us asked him which party he's running for. And I said, because it doesn't matter. He'll win anyway. <laughs> and we both believed from that minute that he had a certain way. I believed America has become a bit of a reality show as a nation. And who better to be the reality show president than Donald Trump?
the broadcaster Johnny Gould. He's the host of the podcast Johnny Gould's Jewish State. Let's talk about a scandal you weren't involved in. 2018, the FT reports that you were the host of the President's Club charity dinner at the Dorchester Hotel. The event became infamous because there were allegations that female staff uh, were, were groped and treated inappropriately. You weren't even there. Take me through what happened and the effect it had. Graham, I've had Twitter pylons now a lot over a number of things. If I've said something on Sky News that people don't like, or I've said something in my role um, of the Supporters Trust in football that the Villa fans don't like, occasionally I get uh, a little bit of grief. But this was far and away the worst, and it happened near midnight because, of course, it was in the FT and it was in the morning paper. Uh, But, of course, the FT releases the paper at, like, 10 o'clock at night. And suddenly I got at-tagged from nowhere, scores and scores of times an hour. And my friend uh, Jonathan Friedland of The Guardian phoned me at midnight and said, listen, you need to sort this out. And I wondered what it was. And as you say, it was an article by Madison Marriage, which um, had... She was was an undercover journalist at the event, wasn't she? She was working as a, a waitress there and she had accused assorted men of, I don't know, um pinching a bum or making passes at her and that it was a sort of lad's night out with cigars. Um, And it was an expose, a very feminist expose, I must say, because there are other sides to the story. A lot of these guys are just sort of harmless away from their wives, talking about their kids, etc. Going out on sort of business evenings, maybe they don't want to be out, but they feel part of it and maybe they can network, etc. Um, But it was an expose and it was, I don't know, a few thousand words. But what was so damaging was the first seven words of it were open quotes. Welcome to the most un-PC event of the year, close quotes, said Johnny Gould. Right. Which meant that anyone who drifted off having uh, read a part of it would have registered me. And there were thousands and thousands of retweets calling for my sacking at Sky News. And I thought, this is dangerous. They removed me from the schedule. And it has to be said, it was Johnny Gould, but it was a different Johnny Gould. With the same spelling of the name. It it was the celebrity auctioneer. And, um, you know, I hold no grudges against him. I think he was a bit sore from it, to be honest. But I'm pleased to say the guy who's raised, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions in charity has come back. And I phoned him up and he wasn't terribly happy with me, but it literally had nothing to do with me. The The reason I took action was not against the auctioneer. I, I, I've got no bone to pick with him. Mine was the clumsiness of the reporting. If they'd have said Johnny Gould, the baseball presenter and celebrity auctioneer, I would have had to suck that up. Maybe people would have still mistaken me. But the FT libeled me, the Sun libeled me, Evolve Politics libeled me, and some other organization I can't remember. And I won tens of thousands of pounds worth of damage. With another guest uh, of the series, the famous Mark Lewis, uh, the lawyer who's been behind all the uh, the Labour Party allegations. In fact, it was uh, Mark who I introduced to John Ware, the Panorama uh, documentary maker who's become a friend and was also a guest on my show over the um, uh, programme is Labour Anti-Semitic, which was run um, a few months before the general election, uh, which, again, he's won damages for as well. Uh, so, um, yes, that was the President's Club. Um, it wasn't pleasant, but Mark Lewis handled it for me. Um, he took away some of the pain of it, and I lived to fight another day. And these things do, you know, do you know, blow over, and um, it's all it's all sort of part of life's experience. And what did you want from that? Did you want financial compensation, or did you just want them to, I don't know, put a big retraction in or something? Um, as part of the deal, they had to put five apologies online every sort of 12 hours and they had to put a printed apology in the FT newspaper. The Sun did the same thing and paid me uh, a compensation. Actually, some of it I gave uh, to charity because, of course, it, it's, it's kind of it's kind of free money. It's not it's not earned money. So it was it was uh, like I didn't feel like I should do it. The most, I tell you what, the most important thing was to not get sacked by Sky News, which was a job that I really, really loved. And and luckily, Sarah Jane Mee 
and um, Jonathan Samuels and a, another set of presenters, you know, put tweets out which were really, you know, really, really humbling, actually, really nice that they should take the time and say it's not him. He's a nice guy, really. And uh, don't sack him. And that was the end of that. And I was I was actually in on Thursday that week. And luckily, we didn't touch on the story. I'm glad we didn't, because I just want to get on with my my lot. It had nothing to do with me. Ironically, I was on a train, the world's longest train journey, at the time of this President's Club malarkey, coming back from my in-laws who live in Strasbourg. Now, there's no direct flight from the European capital to London. So I have to get on this train and go across French country and change at Paris with toddler children. Um, and luckily the phone didn't work, otherwise I would have been having kittens on the train. So that's where I was. That's my alibi. I was nowhere near it. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the unfortunate thing is, though, if you Google your name with the word scandal next to it, the FT article still comes up. I don't know how you get that they taken down. It. Yeah, they've rewritten it. And actually, if you look at it, it says something in italics at the bottom saying, uh, you know, being rewritten to make clear. Um, and, you know, I've got to say something else, which is occasionally, and you can't correct this all the time, Johnny Gould raise, raises hundreds of thousands of pounds for amazing charities. And occasionally famous rugby and cricket stars follow me by accident. <laughs> now, I, I mean, you know, I'm not sure whether they follow me because Johnny's a, a charity hero or because they think I'm the world's greatest broadcaster. But, you know, sometimes uh, Johnny Gould works 48 hours a day, if you know what I mean. At number eight, BJ Shea's Geek Nation. Now, BJ Shea is also the morning radio host on KISW in Seattle, Washington. And BJ, before you moved to Seattle, you worked at a lot of different radio stations. I bounced around the country a lot, um, a lot. My wife is a saint for relocating our young family all those times because I couldn't keep a job. I just, uh, my attitude was not great. I was not great. I wasn't a great worker. I might have been talented. Maybe I was talented, but I was not a great worker. Didn't get along with others. Uh, a lot of stuff up here that I had to figure out eventually. But so, so what yeah, was it I, that made the difference? Did you did you have a an epiphany when you thought, you know, I need to handle this better? Or so was there was there a thing, that, or was there a mentor in particular that sat you down and said, "Look, kid, you're throwing this all away." This is you, this answer is probably not what you would expect, and yet, I mean, it is the truth. Now, if you were to ask B.J. Shea, I would give you a much different answer. But unfortunately, you asked me. Yes, <laughs> you did. Um, and I'm not proud of this. Definitely, I, I shouldn't say I'm not proud of it. This is a learning moment in my life. It had nothing to do with my career, uh, Graham. It had to do with the fact that I was a raging, angry verbally abusive person in those days and to, to i who, was were people close to you or strangers or yes the yes oh, yes oh, uh, the, the closer yeah the closer you were i think the more i was verbally abusive it, it's one of those you know you only hurt the ones you love uh i it, that surely typified with me so there was a moment in my life where i don't know why but i was very very angry and just had a rage fit uh, a, a verbally abusive tirade w with my wife and my probably seven-year-old son and four-year-old daughter and rage, rage, rage. And finally, my wife is like, you need to just go to the bedroom and that's it. I'm not going to let you talk to us this way, this way anymore. Go to the bedroom. I go to the bedroom to cool off. I'm there for an hour, hour and a half, perhaps. And this note is slid under my door. I still have it. I keep it in my wallet with me. It was a defining moment for me. It was, it was a, a, a list of demands by my children. And, you know, Graham, it's written by a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. So stuff that you would put on a refrigerator and that little kid writing. And they were so amazing. I know they were coached by mom because mom's an amazing being. Uh, but it was basically, they were like, dad, this is how we want to be treated. We want you to treat us as human beings. We don't want you to yell at us anymore. We know you're hurting. You need to go get help. It was humbling to read how they saw me. And they were, they were brutally honest, these kids. For, for a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, they were able to come out and say, here's what we're seeing. We want to love you and you make it so hard to do so. 
I sat, I sat in that moment and I was like, wow. I, and so I had, I wasn't even thinking about my career at that point. I just had to fix that. I could not let those kids grow up with that person. It just, you know, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it to them. Um, and I can't say that I fixed it overnight. It took me decades, but I went into therapy and worked on the rage and the anger and then really became a student of therapy. And luckily that transformed everything. It, 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 it made me a better father and a better husband and a better coworker and a better leader. And I always had great people around me in the business. I just was lost in my own illusion of thinking that the world was against me. I, I, it, it's, a, it's a scary thing to think that I was functionally delusional is really what I was. I was seeing windmills as attackers. But if you asked me anything else, I would see, I would appear normal. It's like, this is a chair, this is a desk, this is a computer, and that windmill is gonna kill me. Hmm. That's the thing with functional delusion is that you seem normal because you're getting probably 80% of it, 90% of it right, but that 10 to 20% is what's making you a danger. And I don't know, you know, I, I'm just an average person. I shudder to think if the rest of the world is functionally delusional. I know that I run into people and I see myself. I'm like, oh, I remember this. When I see somebody you know, railing against something or whatever, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is me. I remember me being like this. Um, so getting clear, realizing that I wasn't being attacked by windmills meant that I didn't always have to respond with aggression because I just always felt I was defending what, myself. What kind of thing, how did the windmills show themselves? What kind of things were they, the triggers? Well, you know, the, the, the tr and Graham, the triggers are insane. You, if there's um, words that were said by people, by somebody reminding me of a childhood trauma, but I don't know that. If I don't go exploring, if somebody looks like my father perhaps or my mother, or if one of my bosses looks that way, or if there's a certain noise or scream, things that took me back to places that I didn't know, my body's having this physical reaction of fight or flight. My mind is like, we are in fight or flight. Would you like me to, we need to find out what the source of the problem is. My mind kept looking at right now. The problem is, is it wasn't right now. It was right. from way back, but my mind doesn't know that. My mind is like, look, we got to figure, we got to stop this. You're, you're in trouble. What are we going to do? Ah, it's that person over there. Let's, let's engage and protect ourselves. And eventually I had to start saying, no, wait a second. What's really going on here? Um, I read a great book called Brain Rules by Dr. John Medina. And he said, basically, we are in a state of such fight or flight that it reminds us of when we were back in the Serengeti and we were running from our lives because we were about to be eaten. He said, but nobody is in that position anymore. And yet some of us are in that state as if in fact you are running from a predator, which is unbelievable that we, our bodies are in that state sometimes when he'd be like, we have the ability to get to that state because, well, there was a time where we were running for predators and we shouldn't be eating. And our body's like, dude, we're in trouble. Get the blank out of here. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because we, when you're in that, that state, that the blood diverts to the muscles of the arms and legs and it takes away um, blood and oxygen and whatever from the, the higher reasoning of the brain because you don't need that to just run. You need this to run and you need your higher reasoning when you're in a, a, a situation where, you know, especially if it's a boss or somebody you love, you need higher reasoning to deal with complex issues. You don't need to be Captain Caveman, which is what you become when you're in the fight or flight state. And uh, it's the reason why, you know, I've, I'm sure everybody's had it. You have a, a, a stupid argument with a boss or somebody close. And then later when you're driving home, you think, why didn't I just say this? And then he would have understood. And it's because your higher reasoning was literally shut down at the time. And so, wow, yeah. So, yeah. So, but you had an extreme version of, of something that everybody has, but you had a, a, an unhealthy version of it. I, you know, Graham, I tell everybody that uh, because I believe currently because of COVID that people are in that state because COVID is definitely something where it could kill you. It's scary. So, it's reasonable then to be anxious and even and what people don't understand and behavioral scientists have said this uh and it's not my 
my words, but they have said this, and in, in, unfortunately, the media doesn't cover it that much, but behavioral scientists, they've, they've been saying, we are all in a state of high anxiety, which is why when people are acting a certain way, you'd be like, why are they doing that? It's for the very reason you said, their higher reasoning is gone because they think they're going to die mm. because of this high state of anxiety, which is... Uh, really something that I, I think is so important for uh, for me to understand as a human being that if I see somebody behaving badly or somebody doing whatever, uh, that I have to remember, oh yeah, because I used to be that way. The difference was is that everybody looked at me like, what are you doing? Now everybody's me from all those years ago. I actually have some experience in this because <laughs> I was operating like this, you know, for my own reasons of thinking that my life was in peril. Uh, but it was delusional. The thing is now it's not delusional. And so I, but I have great empathy because I know what this high anxiety state is, but I was forced to learn because my therapist was a really wonderful therapist. He said, I don't try to tell people that they have something wrong. Cause there are some therapies and therapists who will just go and diagnose you and say, well, you have this and you have this. So you should stop doing this. His attitude was, if you believe you were in peril, you are, you are in the same state of somebody who's in peril. And therefore, I need to approach you as if you really were in peril. And, I, and that approach helped out a lot. He approached me as a person that was in trauma because I was in his mind. And then he was able to nurture me and, and calm me down and eventually over the decades teach me how to do that so that when you talk about the higher reasoning being gone and the muscles ready to go and everything going like that, he taught me also to have another voice show up and say, hey, 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 are you really, are you really in danger right now? And with the other voice saying, yes, I am. Are we really, though? Are I think we, that's yeah, a good, about- that's a key point. I know me personally, I'm not, you know, nowhere near those kind of issues, but the, the way I try to deal with it in those situations is to ask myself a question and you did you say are you really and i'll usually ask something something along the lines of how do i really want to come across here to this person and just asking that question turns on some of the higher reasoning of the brain because the brain hates not knowing the answer and, and and questions make it um yeah so there's a little survival technique for anyone who's dealing with it on a milder level than what you had to go through yeah, yeah, I, it's it's a lot of discipline for me too, but it's 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 helped out my career. Right? That was really what turned my career around was that moment with my kids. Yeah. Um, wow! And then, and then I was, and then I realized a lot of great performers actually have had some sort of, you know, it's interesting. In the West, we call it therapy, and it's got a bad name. In the East, it's self inquiry, and all the great yogis have done it, and it's actually quite revered. But it's the same process, uh, and that is basically just looking with inside and so and, and basically out in self realization. That's what therapy is. But unfortunately, the West is, especially if you're a man. I don't. What? 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 No. No. I will. I don't. I don't need mental help. Get out of here. <laughs> Rob Goldstone, you've spent a lot of time with Donald Trump, Rob. What's he like? He has a blustering sort of buffoon quality that when you're around him makes you believe that he's your mate, he's your best friend, and he's looking out for you. I famously said on CNN, which I thought was funny, that he would run over you in his Rolls Royce to get to his gold-plated toilet in Trump Tower and you would still vote for him and think he was your best friend because that's the ability he has. And I have to say, he's in the five or six times I met him, he's only ever been polite, gracious, done ridiculous things. I asked him to do a video for Emin's dad's birthday. He did it at like seven o'clock in the morning. I asked him to do a music video for Emin at literally six or seven in the morning. He did it. We gave him one day's notice to do it. And so I think he likes chaos and drama but that was no question i think he is unfiltered and when people say to me now can you believe how donald trump behaves i'm like well yes have you ever seen donald trump he behaves like donald trump you Hmm. just thought you were electing somebody who would be different once they've been elected he's always been that person it's just magnified so let's fast forward to june 2016 and this meeting that you've set up the the Trump camp are expecting dirt on Hillary. Uh, what happened next? Well, 
in the perfect storm, as they say, I was supposed to, of course, not attend, not be there, have no relevance. But I was supposed to go and introduce this this gang of merry men and one woman to Don Jr. Only because I'd met him a couple of times. They hadn't. And I thought that was a fair ask. So I met them at Trump Tower. I took them up in the elevator and handed them off to Don, who then said, well, where are you going? And I said, I'm leaving. He goes, oh, just stay. Now, again, in the same way as with Emin, you make those split second decisions, which is, it's the son of someone who could become the future president of America asking you to stay. Who cares? That was my thing. I can check my emails. What difference does it make? There's a good and a bad to that, because on the one hand, it put me in the center of the most famous meeting of at least the 21st century. <laughs> but there is something good for that, because if I hadn't sat in on that meeting and everything that came out about what people believed, supposed went on. Well, I might have been one of those people that also believed that it was much more sinister. Because I was sitting there, I know what happened. So I was kind of like, as the Mueller team told me, you're like a witness to a very serious accident. We need to hear from you because you don't have any benefit on either side. It wasn't your meeting. You don't care. But you were a witness to it. So I told them the same as I'll tell you, which is, you know, it started out and this this attorney spoke about this damaging information to the Democrats. But her version of it was that these people named Bill Browder and the Ziff brothers had made donations to Hillary's campaign and they don't pay tax in Russia. So therefore, these were illegal donations. It should never have been done. It's outrageous and all of that. And how dare they give money to the Democrats? And I remember sitting there thinking, I don't know those people, but didn't Donald Trump used to support the Democrats? I literally, it was amusing me. And I thought, well, anyway, she'll get to the point eventually. And then she rambled a bit. And Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, was sat next to me. And I saw him fidgeting and he looked very uncomfortable. And he suddenly said to her, I have to stop you. I have no idea what you're talking about. And I thought, good, because I'd like to have said that. She then began from the exact place, as if you're reading something really boring and someone said, stop. But she began it again. And I could see him so tense that he was texting desperately. We later learned that he was texting his assistant saying, get me out of this madhouse, basically. And Don Jr. was the next one to pipe up and said, with the best will in the world, I don't know why you're addressing this to us. My father's a private citizen. You should address it to the Obama administration. And she said what she really wanted to talk about was something called the Magnitsky Act. I had never, ever heard of it. I'm since an expert on it. And it's where, because of sanctions imposed by uh, America on Russia, over somebody called Sergei Magnitsky, who apparently was murdered by the Kremlin because of I don't know what, Russia imposed an adoptions freeze. And so when you hear things like that meeting was about adoption, it was about adoption. This lawyer was trying to get those sanctions removed because it was causing a lot of issues for families who wanted to adopt children and suddenly couldn't. So if you've been waiting a year or two years and your child was now ready to be you couldn't adopt a child from Russia or the former Soviet Union because of these rules. And so she was a lobbyist to have the Magnitsky Act overturned. And the very people she was saying were doing something dodgy in their donations to Hillary's campaign were almost the writers, the creators of the Magnitsky Act. So it's all joined up. The media didn't bother to join up the dots. And they said, it's outrageous that Don Jr. said it's about adoption. How ridiculous. Sounded like a cover story. Sounded like a ridiculous cover yeah, story. Yeah, it was about adoption. And in fact, so much so that when the meeting was over, because Don ended the meeting, I jumped up and herded them out like cattle to get them out. I was hugely embarrassed. And it takes quite a bit to embarrass me. And he put his arm on my shoulder and I said, I have to just tell you, I've never been as embarrassed. And Don said to me, I just have no idea what that was about. And I said, adoption, apparently. And when we walked out of it, the only thing I would have, if someone had put a gun to my head one year later, one minute, and said, what was that meeting about? I would have said, adoption. I just don't know why. And so it wasn't a lie. It was a half fact. When, when they asked him what it was about, what I believe he should have said was, it was about adoption, but we thought it was going to be about blah, blah, blah 
what he kept saying was it was about adoption. He didn't give it context. And as I've learned over this last few years, context is what matters. It was about adoption, but they went into it thinking it was about something completely different. I think it was a bit of a bait and switch. It wasn't a language issue. It was that um, to her and to President Vladimir Putin, Magnitsky is a huge thorn in their side. I say that because years later, he and President Trump stood together in Helsinki. They did some big meeting there. And one of the only things Putin talked about was the Magnitsky Act. And as I heard him talk about Bill Browder, I was like, wait, this is all these names that came up at my meeting that they're dismissing as nonsense. It's obviously not nonsense to Vladimir Putin. And if you're a lawyer that has some connection to the Kremlin, well, it is important. So just because somebody at the New York Post or the whatever doesn't understand the connection doesn't mean it was hugely important. And there was, when I say in my email, they have damaging information about Hillary, whatever. Well, there was damaging information about funding to her campaign, but it wasn't damaging because to the Trump campaign, who cares if they're donating? She cared because she wanted to say these horrible Magnitsky people who you support or not you, who America support, are donating to Hillary's campaign, bad people. Mm. And and that's why it made no sense. And that's why they stopped the meeting and said, this is a waste of time. Like, we don't even know what you're talking about. So it was a big jigsaw puzzle. It had lots of pieces. But the bottom line is the meeting lasted about 15 minutes. It was the most awful 15 minutes I've ever spent. And at the end of it, we went downstairs and I called Emin in the middle of the night in Russia and said, this was the single most embarrassing thing you've ever asked me to do. And you're someone that's asked me to do a lot of really, really embarrassing things. And I never want to speak about it again. And I hung up on him. And we never did speak about it again until the emails broke. It sounds like you just got caught up in all of this. And the Mueller report basically backs everything you've said. In fact, if it was some sort of covert meeting, you didn't even try to hide it. You like had, didn't you have your Facebook? You, you, you... I did check in on Facebook and yeah. said meeting at Trump Tower. And I have to say <laughs> that the Mueller people did say, would we be right? In... Because you have to understand when people interview you, like Bob Mueller's people, like Congress, they know the answer. They just need you yeah. to say it. Yeah. So when they said to me, would we be right in thinking you weren't exactly keeping the meeting private? What they wanted me to say, I understood. I said, well, I did check in on Facebook. They said, thank you. Right. So it's most spies, most puppets of Putin don't say, I'm about to put polonium in this man's sushi <laughs> at the restaurant. I do hope they serve, you know, rice. It just doesn't happen. And, and part of the reason I checked in was because not only am I not politically a Trump supporter, but all my friends are radical, diehard liberals. So anytime I ever saw Trump, mentioned Trump, they would go ballistic on social media. And I love that. <laughs> so as I also told mothers, people who laughed the way you are, I said, it just made me happy. It makes me a horrible person, but it made me happy. And so I love the idea of saying this time, not only am I walking past Trump Tower, I'm going to a meeting there. Hello. And it sent them ballistic. But again, it was a really good thing that I did it because it was another thing. They had this idea that it was this covert, you know, spy meeting. Well, you don't normally say had a Starbucks up at Trump Tower going to the meeting at Trump. You don't. Yeah. And so that's what happened. And it, it was kind of bizarre, to say the least. But that was the meeting. And even then, I thought nothing of it. The only thing I thought was what a waste of time. And. A few months later, after Trump had become president, Emin said, my dad would like you again to ask for a meeting. And this time I was a bit wiser, not because of the content. I thought, I can't ask them again. They'll think I'm an idiot, a complete idiot. So I sent it on Thanksgiving or just before Thanksgiving Day. I knew no one would read it. And I sort of said, if you can or you can't. And I sent it to someone again that was very connected. I never heard, I never followed up. Usually I follow up everything. And about three months after that, one of Emin's dad's colleagues said, this same lawyer will be back in the States and this and would like to meet. And this time I said, you have to stop asking. It was an appalling meeting. It was awful. And I won't do an ask. And they said, understood. And I never heard about it again. But there are people, still some people 
who still think that you, uh, Rob Goldstone, are part of an illegal Russian conspiracy. What would you say to them? I would say get off Twitter because I've read these people. <laughs> you know, there are people who even today say, we understand that Bob Mueller, who had $34 million, 16 attorneys, hundreds of investigators, the FBI, the CIA, the whatever, spent two years investigating this, came up with the idea that the meeting basically was a nothing. It shouldn't have taken place. And yes, they should have done it. But what they basically said was that Don Jr. was a bit too dumb with the best will in the world to know he shouldn't have done it. And therefore, there were no charges to bring against him. It also had nothing of any value to the campaign. Yeah, and it doesn't say that the Russians didn't collude. It just says, Correct. yeah. And I've never said that. The Russians might. But I also think, on some level, Britain's probably interfered in people's elections around the world. America's interfered in elections around the world. And Russia and China and whoever else. So, But that's not what was being discussed. Um, there are people on Twitter that say, forget Bob Mueller, forget Congress, forget this. They've missed it all. It's obvious. Here's Rob Goldstone's email. So, you know, Jack Smith sat in wherever Birkenhead thinks, actually believes that they have solved it. And it used to be that I used to try and calmly answer these people. There's no point. If you believe what you believe, then you believe it. What I now say to people is, it's a quote I stole. Now, I do get quotes wrong, so I'll try this one. It's a quote I stole from an old Democratic uh, congressman who said, you're entitled to your own opinions. You're not entitled to your own facts. And that's what I say to people. I don't care if you like me, hate me, think I'm a this, but you can't say that I am because it's not true. And that's, that's where I leave it. But yes, there are people that believe all those people miss the obvious and why because mine's in writing i have to say mine at one point was the only tangible piece of evidence of any russian collusion and i said it in my book and i stated it many times publicly if the Mueller, if the Mueller inquiry was going to believe that my email was a part of the cornerstone of russiagate there wouldn't be any collusion <laughs> because i know what that was about. and that is basically what it said 